Please join me in standing for the gospel reading. The gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 49, reading in Christ's name. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give it, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will it be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher. Everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you seek the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take out the log of, out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. So we continue our series on biblical discipleship, on what disciple is and what it is to make disciples. Um, two weeks ago, we started this and we defined what a disciple is. The word disciple in the New Testament means learner. And it means to be a continual learner who was born again as a new creation in Christ Jesus, who places the will of God first above that of their own or anyone else's, and they are not ashamed of the word of God, nor who Jesus Christ is. Remember, we must be a disciple in order to make disciples. Last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 13, and we understood that um, this treasure, this great treasure, the pearl of great price, something that we would sell all that we have as we take up our cross and follow Christ, that we treasure Christ and his salvation, a salvation that endures to eternal life and promises the inheritance of eternal life is the greatest treasure that we can possess. A disciple also seeks to bring others to Christ because we understand the eternal ramifications of someone who rejects Christ and his salvation. A disciple understands that our soul, yes, it has a finite beginning, but we'll spend Eternity in one of two places. That motivates us to bring people to Jesus Christ. We have the heart of an evangelist. A disciple of Christ also is passionate about making disciples, getting to the place where you feel comfortable making disciples. And we mentioned that that begins in our own home with our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and then those who God has brought into our life. But this morning, we take a look at some characteristics of a disciple of Christ. We focus our attention on the willing obedience that runs through all of Scripture. Even before sin entered into the world, as we think about the Garden of Eden, ask yourself this question. Why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden? And God said to Adam... You can have any other tree, but, but not this one. Has anyone ever thought, well, why did he put that in there? Because willing obedience, even before sin entered the world, was still an act of worship to God. As we read through our responsive reading, I love the, the final two verses. 
For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I wonder if we can say that on a regular basis. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, which I will meditate on your statutes. And so out of the treasure of our heart, that great treasure that Christ paid for through his life, death, and resurrection, we willingly walk in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, doing our best to adhere to the Ten Commandments as an act of worship, not because we have to, but because we want to, because of what Christ has done for us. This is how we worship God. And so as we look at the characteristics of a disciple, walking in will and obedience, as we kind of pick this apart, I pray that God would speak to us this morning and that the Holy Spirit would speak through me and the power of God's holy word. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for this text, and I thank you for this reminder as you describe the characteristics of a disciple. May every word that proceeds from my mouth be from you and not from me. May it be in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word, and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray all this in Christ's name, and all of God's people said... And so for the sake of time, I'm not going to reread verses 37 through 42, but I want to talk about them and, and kind of look at some things here. A lot of people use this verse to basically say we're never to judge anyone or we're never to call someone out on their sin or to make someone aware of sin that are, that's hindering not only their faith in God, but also the life of a congregation. But look at verse 39 for a moment. As Jesus told them a parable, can a blind man lead a blind man? So there's this purpose that disciples are supposed to lead others in the way of Christ. But then he continues in verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when they're fully trained, will be like their teacher. Well, let me ask you this. Does Jesus confront people? Does Jesus lovingly make people aware of sin that is hindering their walk of faith with him? And the answer is yes. In Badger, we're going through the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation, and six of those seven are called to repent, and if they don't repent, there's a consequence that Christ will remove something from that church. There's, an, there's a consequence and so as we look at that, the rest of it in 41 and 42, where you, you see the speck in your brother's eye, that's judgmentalism. But Christ does not want us to judge. And this is our first point. Christ does not want us to judge, but he does want us to exercise humble biblical discernment. Because it's not saying don't do this, it's telling us how to do it. I love what uh, Dr. Robert James Utley says about this text. This is what he says. He goes, this verse is often quoted to prove that Christians should not judge each other at all. However, Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20, that give us the three steps of reconciliation. If your brother or sister sins against you, go to them. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the whole chapter is about confronting believers on their sin. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 show that God's word teaches that believers are to evaluate one another spiritually. One's attitudes and motives are the key. And that's the point that Jesus is stressing here. Why are we doing it? That question, why am I doing what I'm about to do and what are the motives and intentions of my heart? If we're doing it out of a spirit of superiority and self-righteousness, well, that's judgmentalism. That's what the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes did. Oh, look at us, we're better than you. And like that guy that was praying in the temple courts, oh, I'm glad I'm not like this, this sinner that's standing over here. That's not what a disciple does. But when a disciple sees someone in sin, what they do is like, I wonder if that person is aware of how this is hindering their faith. 
I wonder if, if they understand the dangerous situation they're placing themselves in in continuing in unrepentant sin. We are called to have genuine care and concern for that person. If I'm going I'm to say something, and I'm going to say it as gently and as nicely as I can. To not say something about someone's sin is self-preservation. Because it's easier, isn't it? Right? But in Philippians chapter 2, we're to place the needs of others as more important than ourselves. But we always do this with gentleness, humility, and patience. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2 says, Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 2 is talking about love your neighbor as yourself. To love your neighbor as yourself is to speak the truth in love out of genuine concern with love, patience, gentleness. And it's hard, isn't it? We are to always exercise biblical discernment with the fruits of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians chapter 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so please don't see this text as, oh, I'm not supposed to biblically discern things. No, we're not to be a judge. We're not to be judgmental. But we are absolutely called to walk in biblical discernment with the love of Christ in a way that places a genuine concern for the person you're you're about to speak to. And when you do that, even though it's tough, it's difficult, and oftentimes that person will most likely get mad at you. You're doing the will of the Lord and you're walking in willing obedience to the word of God. And that's why we do it. We do it for the love of the other person. But more than, more than anything, we do it because Christ has commanded us to. The next thing that we see in our text is that a disciple bears good biblical fruit. So Jesus continues in verse 43, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. So this is about sanctification. This is about spiritual growth and maturity. It's about embracing a life of confession and repentance toward a salvation without regret. And so it begins with us. And as we think about all of these things, and as we think about exercising biblical discernment, it really, really applies to leadership. And so in, in leadership with pastors and, and deacons and church council members, this is where we are to lead by example. We are to embrace this life of sanctification, this life of spiritual growth and maturity. Why? Because it honors Christ. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 remind us of that. The Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, because of the cross of Christ, because of his incredible victory that yields the promise of eternal life, because of the mercies of God, present your bodies, all of who you are, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. This world will just say, oh, let everybody just be everybody and we're not to ever say anything negative to anybody or we're not to say that that they're actually walking in a way that's harmful to them. None of that is biblical. That's loving yourself first. That's self-preservation. That's avoiding anything that would cause discomfort and that is not love. It begins with our children, right? Parents, we have the honor of correcting our children. We have the honor of of teaching them what's right and wrong. And the Ten Commandments are a great tool for that. Amen? It's a wonderful tool that we can memorize those Ten Commandments. Have no other gods before me. Uh, Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother and on and on. And all those beautiful commandments guide us and lead us. And, And that's what the writer of Psalm 119 is saying. I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. Because they guide us. They're a lamp 
to our feet and a light to our path, and they guide us as to what is right and wrong in the eyes of the Lord. That's why Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. It's like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. God wants to mold us into people that through our life, as an act of worship, proclaim the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul also wrote a letter to a pastor to encourage him, a man named Timothy, and he says, let people see your progress. Let let people see what God is doing in your life so that you too can then inspire other people. Let them see your love for the word. Let them see your passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ because it preaches a sermon. Another portion of scripture that talks about bearing biblical fruit is John chapter 15, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. The difficult part about growing in Christ and maturing in Christ is it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because it has to do with being brutally honest about ourselves. The Ten Commandments are a mirror to our heart and the motives that we oftentimes have, the bad ones. Oh, this is going to make me look good. Yeah, I, I'm doing it for Jesus, but you know, I, I'm going I'm to get a lot of accolades for this. It's interesting, isn't it? That word being transformed in Romans chapter 12 and 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 is this continual process of being a learner, a disciple, embracing sanctification, embracing a life of spiritual growth and maturity, allowing the Father to prune us. Why? Because he is worthy. Because Jesus has paid it all. Amen? Does the pruning process hurts? It does for me. The final thing that we see in our text is that a disciple is an avid hearer and a doer of the word of God. A disciple is an avid hearer and doer of the word of God. Jesus asks a very important and profound question in verse 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? And I remember reading that this week going, my word, Lord, help me. So many times I fail. Now there's grace. Amen. There is an inexhaustible, extravagant source of grace and mercy that has come through Christ Jesus. And I say hallelujah and amen because that's a grace that is greater than our sin. But at the same time, there's this willing balance to see ourselves in the mirror of God's law, to see the reality of our own divisive heart that is sometimes cruel towards people and unkind towards people and see those things and go, God, help me, please run to the cross of Calvary on a daily basis and say, God, your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, bring to completion that which you started in my heart. I wish I could tell you that's an easy process or that it's a fun process, but it's not. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I'll show you what it's like. It's like a man building his house upon a rock foundation. And of course, that rock is Christ and his holy word. The storms of life will come and that house will not be moved. But if you do not build your house upon the rock, if you are conformed to the ways of the world and not transformed by the renewing of your mind, great will be the ruin of that house. The writer of James echoes this same reality in chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let every person... Can I tell you what that word every means in the Greek? (laughs) Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. The anger of a person does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Ouch. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, And receive with meekness, with humility, the implanted word of God, which is able to save our souls. 
but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Here's where the rubber hits the road here. This is the act of worship. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a person who looks intently at their natural face in the mirror. And as he looks, or they look at themselves, then they go away. At once, they forget what they look like. Have you ever looked something up on your phone, got the answer, shut your phone off, and then totally forgot what the answer was? That's what I'm talking about. I do that with the weather app all the time. I like, what that is. It's like I look, I see it. It just doesn't register. I don't soak it in. I don't consciously say, hey, it's going to be 76 degrees. Today is a high. I'll close it. I'm like, what did it say? I can't even remember. But that's the picture that James is painting. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And all of a sudden, oh, what was that? I can't remember. Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I don't need to go to church. Willing obedience has always been and will always be an act of worship. It has always been and will always be a characteristic of a disciple. Jesus talks about this a lot, especially in the Gospel of John. You, you look at chapters 12 through 19, and you're going to hear how many times, he who keeps my commandments, he it is who's my disciple. And you're going to hear it over and over and over again. Earlier, I talked about how John 15 is that picture of sanctification, of bearing biblical fruit. Well, in that chapter, in verse 8 of John chapter 15, it says this, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciple. And that's what it means to be a doer of the word. I really like, and this is on the back of the sermon notes if you have it. I love what the Lutheran Study Bible says this about this final portion of our text. This is what it says. This parable demonstrates the futility of merely paying lip surface to God's word. I mean, being a hearer and not a doer. The house of a foolish builder cannot withstand life's storms. In contrast, life's torments are often defining moments for those who faithfully follow Christ. For they reveal the unshakable strength of a faith that is rightly placed or built on Jesus. I'm going to just read that again. In contrast, life's torments, life's disasters, life's hard times are often the defining moments for those who faithfully follow Christ. For they reveal the unshakable strength of a faith rightly placed in Christ. And so as we put this together, what do we walk away with? Number one, we are called to not judge, not be judgmental, but yet we are commanded to exercise biblical discernment toward other believers, especially those in leadership. Secondly, when confronting a brother or sister in Christ, we must always begin with self-examination and then proceed with genuine care and concern, walking in the fruits of the Spirit with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. This begins with our children, doesn't it? I have seen parents in the middle of a street screaming at their child. That doesn't do anybody any good. The motives and intentions of our heart are very important to God and they should be important to us. Willing obedience to God always has been and always will be a characteristic of a disciple of Christ. This is what it means to bear biblical fruit, embracing that life of spiritual growth and maturity, being a continual learner who seeks to make disciples all for the glory of God and help me out, not because I have to, but because I want to, because of what Christ has done for us. This is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. I pray that we would always be motivated by the incredible victory of Christ Jesus on the cross of Calvary as we live this life for the sake of the next 
trying to bring as many people as we can with the heart of an evangelist as a disciple maker for Christ to bring as many people as we can to heaven with us. And again, that begins in our home. As you embrace this life, this uncomfortable way of growing in Christ continually, just remember that he is with you, that he will never leave you or forsake you. The power of the Holy Spirit is at work with you and his presence is real because everyone who places their trust in him will not be put to shame. Lord, I thank you for this text and this brief reminder of the characteristics of a disciple. We understand that we now are not above you. A pupil cannot be above its master, and you are our master, you are our teacher. And Lord, help us to walk in your footsteps in the power of your Holy Spirit as best we can, embracing that transformative life as you mold us to the people you've called us to be. All the while, building our faith, our home, our life, our family on the rock of Jesus Christ so that one day when we pass from this life to the next, you will welcome us into our eternal inheritance. May this be so, and may it be a reality for every single person under the sound of my voice. I pray this in Christ's name and all of God's people said,